Okay. It is 6.32 p.m. I'd like to call this meeting of the Community Development Committee to order. While this meeting is being held in person, in consideration of the ongoing COVID-19 health concerns, we are offering the option for the public to participate through Zoom if preferred. Instructions on how to attend virtually are included in the City Council calendar item listed on the front page of missionks.org. The public is also invited to participate in the meeting. If you are participating through Zoom, please either add your comment in the chat feature and it will be read out loud, or note that you would like to speak and we will call on you shortly to make your comment verbally. Please remember your comments or questions are visible to everyone in the meeting. If you are part of our in-person group tonight, please raise your hand, but stay seated and we will call on you to go to the lectern to make your comment. When you make your comment, please state your name and city of residence for the record. Also be conscientious of others trying to speak and speak slowly and clearly. This meeting will be recorded and posted on the city's website at missionks.org. Please contact the administration offices at 913-676-8350 with any questions or concerns. Ms. Folks, would you please call the roll? Thomas? Here. Boltinghouse? Here. Ryard? Here. Crane? Here. Inman? Here. Josie? Here. Davis? Here. Yeah. Our first item of business tonight is public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to comment now on an item that is not on our agenda tonight? Okay, we'll now proceed with the regular agenda. We have one presentation on the agenda this evening, an update from the Mission Sustainability Commission on 2022 successes and goals for 2023 with Emily Randall. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think as most of you are aware, the Sustainability Commission presents, or it is the custom that we uh, present to the council at least annually to just give an update of the commission's activities. So I'd like to invite our 2023 chair, Ellen Parker, to introduce the topic. And I will try to pull up their PowerPoint as quickly as possible. Thank you, Emily. Um, would you like me to wait till the PowerPoint? Um, actually, or... I think I can Oh. Yay, there it is. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Ellen Parker, as Emily said, the chair this year. Um, we've come before this group uh, each year since 2017 to provide an update on the Sustainability Commission's activities. We appreciate the opportunity to provide this update and engage with Council to hear your thoughts on our work. So um, at the end of 2021, uh, we created a strategic plan to help shape our work, and we came up with five goals, which you see on this slide. The commission prioritized them, so they are listed in order of importance. And I'm gonna take the time to read through them um, because you'll see that we are being intentional and in ensuring that the activities we pursue align with one or more of these goals. So first, to partner with city council, boards and commissions to center sustainability and achieve the goals of the Climate Action KC Regional Climate Action Plan. Two, to make Mission a resilient and welcoming community where people want to visit, work, live, and age in place. Three, make Mission a responsible steward of our natural resources and be a good neighbor in our corner of the planet. Four, educate residents about sustainability goals and practices and empower individual action. And five, partner with local businesses to advance sustainability goals. So now I'm going to talk about successes of the past year, and you'll notice that one or more of these goals is being achieved in all of these activities listed. And this is just a handful of things we've done this year, but so next slide. Uh, the first thing we're proud of is the creation of the Climate Action Task Force. This group brings together members of the city's boards, staff, and council. It's a wonderful partnership, and the group has identified recommendations to support the Regional Climate Action Plan's goal of net zero emissions by 2050. We're proud to say Mission's goals are more aggressive than that, to be net zero emissions in government operations 
by the city by 2025 and in energy generation in homes and buildings by 2035. So we just wanna say thank you to the council for showing your support of these goals with funding. Next, um, we hosted an extremely successful Go Green Environmental Fair in September of this year. Nine cities participated. There were 47 booths and over 500 attendees. It was a fantastic collaboration with regional partners. And it won Best Green Event from the Mid-American Regional Council, or MARC, um, at their Solid Waste Management District annual luncheon in December. And extra special thanks, thanks to Miss Terry Baugh, who's sitting in the audience, for her effort to make that, that thing happen. Um, next, we had four developers complete our sustainability scorecard this year. Um, projects included the Preserve, Mission Vale, 58 Knoll, and the block project at 5665 Fox Ridge. And through these efforts, we helped shape conversations around sustainable building. And finally, we increased our communication efforts this year. Uh, we shared successes with the public it, with updates in the Mission Magazine on a variety of sustainability topics for all ages. So now I'm gonna just mention some of our continued successes this year. Um, our battle, battery recycling program, um, it's pretty amazing since it started. We've now recycled 2.16 tons of batteries. So, and it just, it just never ends. So um, the other recycling program that's been a success is the holiday light recycling. I don't have numbers on that, but I know it was, uh, it just keeps growing as more citizens become aware of it. So thank you all for spreading the word on that too. Um, a new thing this year, we encourage citizen awareness of what to recycle by uh, participating in Johnson County's Recycle Right program. And we wrote up an article about that for Mission Magazine. So that was pretty cool. Um, our communities for all ages work continues. Uh, we advocate, advocate for those priorities in local government and city government. And we continue our volunteer efforts through direct service projects, such as cleaning up Shawnee Mission Parkway with, a couple times a year with our Adopt a Street program. Uh, we, table at, we tabled at the Mission Market and other community events and more. I just wanna mention the Facility Conservation Improvement Program. I know that didn't happen this year, but this year it was honored at, at, for, by Mark as a resilient success story. And my understanding is it was a previous member of the Sustainability Commission who sort of had that idea and, and just a wonderful example of things that can come from our commission um, that can be implemented by the city. So just wanted to highlight that. Um, I think Manny Tri Trio, but, so call him out. Okay, and so now for the future. Um, really, it's just for this year, we wanna do more of the same, just a little bit more. We want to keep the focus on our successful programs, build momentum we've got now that we've got goals and priorities set. And we want more progress on climate action goals, more volunteering, and more support in the community. So uh, one really exciting thing that we uh, have locked down for next year, there will be another environmental fair, and um, it'll be bigger and better. And so mark your calendars, it's going to be September 23rd. And finally, I want to just take a minute to thank each and every member of the Sustainability Commission. I'm not going to list them all, but, you know, we're all volunteers and we're really proud of our work. We're proud that our success attracts interest from a broad swath of our community. Our members cover a wide range of experience and talent. We bring together real world knowledge from Mark, Ripple Glass, community volunteering, public relations and local businesses and more. We think the future is bright. Thank you to the council and our council liaisons, Debbie Kring and Hillary Thomas for your support. The support from all of you is crucial to our work. Um, sustainability is only growing in importance and prominence as the climate continues to change. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to contribute and make mission a better place. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but I have a question for you. Um, are there any topics you want us to focus on, on through our volunteering enthusiasm, expertise, and advocacy? If so, let me know. And 
that's all I got. Thanks for, thanks for the opportunity to tell you about what we're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. And are there any questions or comments? Just a, a couple comments. One, I don't know how much we added on here regarding your role in looking our, at our economic development, building content, um, structure, infrastructure, et cetera, based on sustainability principles. That was one. And the second one, I, the last meeting you had, the city of Shawnee and Roland Park came. They had word of mouth that this sustainability commission was doing above and beyond what anybody could think of, and they wanted to come see if Learn. they could like parent the thing and and get it started in their own city so that may even go further with other cities too so you used to be complimented on your role as a as a leader in the sustainability arena thanks thank you mayor yeah hi ellen thanks for coming thanks for coming commission members um i just did want to share because i know one of the goals is working with our business community yes. um that i was at the elevate salon grand opening on sunday and their owner jen is very interested in discussing um a potential small business uh, recycling program and i think she had some information on how downtown overland park did that so I think she'd be a good one to, to reach out to if you're looking to expand your recycling efforts. Thank you. Anybody else question or comment? All right, thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you to the commission. Much appreciated. Our first action item on the agenda this evening is the acceptance of the meeting minutes with Robin Folks. Thank you. Draft minutes of the January 11th Community Development Committee meeting are included for review and acceptance in your packet tonight. Recommend that we accept. Okay. Everybody good with consent, consent. I take it. <laughs> Next, we will consider a contract for restoration work on slide one at the Mission Family Aquatic Center with Penn Albany. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So we've got two slides at the Mission Family Aquatic Center. The first slide was installed as part of the restoration back in 2014. That's our orange slide or the open flume slide. The second one was installed in 2018, and that's the green closed flume slide. Uh, this uh, action item is specifically for the orange slide, uh, which is original. Like I'd mentioned, it's been through friction water, UV damage, as well as chemical exposure. And it's pretty typical for any kind of outdoor slide um, to require some sort of um, restoration within a five to seven year period. So things like fiberglass laminate, um, deterioration, seams falling out of alignment, and that's just from repetitive use, surface blistering, weathering, those types of elements. This was actually on the 2019 capital improvement plan but because of closures and uh, adjustments in our uh, hours of operation, it was pushed to uh, 2023. And, uh, you know, we did a pretty good job with preventive maintenance and making sure that it was meeting all of the needs of the patrons. So we feel uh, we feel we were good stewards with that additional time allotment. Uh, four bids were so solicited from Blastic Clean, Slide Right Restoration, Safe Slide Restoration Services, and then Bainham Amusements, and they range from 24000 to 48000 and change. The uh, This project specifically was approved for 2023 as part of the five-year capital improvement plan, and staff recommends approval of a contract with Blastic Clean in an amount not to exceed $24,500 with funding from the Parks and Recreation Sales Tax Fund, and uh, we're hoping to complete this project as soon as possible, but likely around the early spring, March timeframe. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Penn. Any questions, comments? Is there a recommendation? Recommend we take this to council on consent. All right. Thanks, Penn. And for your next one, um, third action item tonight is consideration of the Mohawk Park phase two final design documents. So as we're all aware, uh, Mohawk Park Phase 1 project began in September of 2022. So we are coming up on the completion of that project right around April of this year. And we want to move relatively seamlessly into Phase 2 final design elements. So uh, those 
Those elements include a 10 foot wide perimeter trail that spans the entire park, a new ADA all abilities accessible playground and features, a play feature shade sales, which would be a first in mission, port in place, soft fall zone playground surfacing, concrete court for pickleball and, uh, pick and basketball, trail lighting, landscaping, and then uh, parallel parking on the eastern edge of, uh, of Mohawk Park. So with those elements, um, the fact that Confluence has been in a support role for SFS architects throughout phase one and through our conceptual design process, staff is recommending approval of a contract with Confluence for final design services for Mohawk Park phase two in an amount not to exceed $125,000. This project will be paid for from the outdoor park system improvements budget identified in the Parks and Recreation Capital Improvement Plan, funded by Parks and Recreation sales tax, as well as 2022 A bond proceeds. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions, comments? All right, is there a recommendation? I'd recommend that we go ahead and take this to council if you have a consent. I agree. All right. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. Our next action item tonight will be consideration of the Operation Green Light Cooperative Agreement with the Mid America Regional Council. And we'll have Celia Duran. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, it's kind of not used to having this right up <laughs> <after> my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Operation Greenlight, or OGL, is a regional arterial traffic signal coordination system managed by the Mid-America Region, Regional Council. Um, Mission has participated since 2010, as well as 25 or 26 other agencies in Kansas and Missouri. This cooperative agreement ident identifies a number of items, but the most important is the cost sharing. Um, we currently own and maintain three signals on Shawnee Mission Parkway that are operated by OGL. Um, one is at Roland Drive, Nall, and Lamar, and the cost is $8,800 per year. Um, and I would appreciate... Um, but I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Help you Can you move it back? Oh, yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Let's do this. You'll there still you pick up. <laughs> Just fine. <laughs> sorry. Any any questions or comments for Celia? <laughs> Is there a recommendation? Yes, I I recommend that we take this to council on consent. Everybody good with consent? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Um, and our final action item tonight is consideration of a memorandum of agreement with the Mid-America Regional Council for stormwater guidelines updates. And that's yours again. Okay, I'll try to do a little bit better this time. <laughs> um, APWA and Mark have uh, combined uh, to uh, prepare a stormwater criteria, which is known as APWA 5600, as well as the um, BMP manual, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, these documents have been updated periodically, and the committee has decided just due to changes in technology, modeling, data, and community priorities to um, update these again, and there's a committee formed as well as a consultant. And so uh, the total cost of the project is $790,400, and missions uh, cost would be $5,000. And that this will not only address all the criteria, but also, you know, as part of climate change, everybody's been talking about the increased rain element, so that's something that they would be directly looking at. So I think it's a really good um, minor share of the cost for a really good um, <laughs> that wasn't <me. laughs> And I'd be happy to answer that. Yeah, the technology is really helping. Okay. Yeah, I had a question. Yeah, Mayor. Uh, actually, two questions. Um, so one was I was a little bit surprised about the list of um cities participating and some of the bigger cities missing. So just wondering if you could speak to composition of the participating cities and then also um with the timeline extended out to uh 2025, it looked like. Are we hoping that there'll be, you know, interim things learned along the way that we'll be able to apply as we continue to up update our stormwater? 
so um, each city was asked if they would participate in some of the larger ones, you know, various ones decided not to. They have their own, they've already modified, like Overland Park has already modified a lot of their criteria. So I think that they didn't feel the need to participate. But even if you don't pay, you still, the you know, the criteria is on the website that you can use. But um, yes, I mean, we meet monthly and go over things and discuss, and it's a big group of all the cities. And so I think that, you know, we can continue to apply and modify um, as we can. Any other questions or comments? Okay, is there a recommendation? Yeah, I recommend that we take it to council on consent. Everybody good with consent? Okay, thank you very much, Celia. Thank you. Okay. So it's about that time of year where we start finding sinkholes, and <laughs> unfortunately. And at 49th and Lamar, while the crew is out there inspecting inlets, mm -hmm. uh, we happen to find a big void, like it's on the north side of the street and it's taped off and combed off. But if you happen to go over there, it's like a, a 10 foot um, hole right next to the curb in the inlet where it, it's um, sank. And what happened is when we went into the inlet, we noticed that the front of it is all, all deteriorated and then the side is as well. And so when the water off the street and from the rain comes in, it instead of dropping down the inlet and going through the pipe, it drops down into the side and it's creating this void. So we're really concerned that if we don't take care of it right away, then our street may start to go. So um, we obtained two bids and the low bidder is GP construction, which is they've, they've prepared, repaired some of our other sinkholes and the cost is about 29,000. Um, and uh, if you agree, we will proceed with repairs and then a re resolution ratifying the cost will be presented at the next council meeting. Is it George Butler? Um, no, it's GB Construction. Sounds like George Butler. I don't think it's George it's Butler. Not. I think it's a new, it's, an, it's a different firm. It used to be Bazine. Any other questions or comments? And what kind of uh, action do you need from us, Laura? Just a recommendation? I'm just going to proceed with yeah. the emergency repair. Okay. Yeah, just wanted to make you aware of it. The second bid was... It, so the second kiss of construction, they said that they wouldn't repair the box that they wanted to, they wanted to repair all the pipe and the endless as well. And that was about 59,000 or 57,000. So we're electing to go with the low bidder or GB. Plus they've repaired at least two or three of our other sinkholes. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. And I have one more item. Oh. <laughs> um, so we're we're working on um, the Fox Ridge project, as you know, and we put it out to bid today. And as part of that, we were talking to the engineer, and it turns out that the traffic signal arms, the controller, the cabinet, and the radar have a seven month lead time. So if we wait to get the contractor on board, we may not get the signal installed till after the project should be finished. So they recommend that we. We'll save the 15%, then that will also allow the contractor to have the materials they need to get get the, the signal built during the time that they're already there. And right now the cost is about $100,000, which is estimated, but I'm getting two quotes. And so if you agree to that, we would also bring that to the February 15th council meeting for your approval. Questions or comments on that one? Okay, same thing, Laura, we're good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our action items this evening. We do have one discussion item, a discussion about short-term rental properties from Laura Smith. Ms. Smith, will you please kick off the discussion? Let me get to the right. Okay, so I know that we have, um, talked at a couple of retreats, council retreats in the past and some of our other work sessions about this issue of short-term rental properties. I know some of you have received calls from constituents um, asking questions or concerned about the potential of short-term rentals. Um, cities receive some of those as well. Um, 
I think it will be part and parcel of some of the things that we talk about coming out of the comp plan um, as we move that forward in the coming months, but we wanted to at least get in front of you with some of the look and sort of where we stand um, from a current code standpoint with respect to short-term rental properties um, and just really open it up this evening. I'll hit a couple of things from um, the paper that was included in the packet. We really wanted to just open it up for a more general council discussion uh, this evening so we can get a sense of um, how, how you would like us to proceed. Um, I think, and, and then certainly we can answer questions. I know Brian's been very heavily involved with this. We've met as a leadership team um, and really looked at this issue and, and tried to look at it um, kind of all the way around. I think as we all know, um, they've really become short-term rentals have become more and more popular over the last decade. Um, it's difficult um, for us to be able to track exactly how many short-term rental properties we may have in Mission. I think we've estimated at this point somewhere between 10 and 15. And we'll come back at, at, um, to that point about trying to collect some additional data on that. So property owners who rent homes for short-term short rentals typically fall into three categories. This is strange. <laughs> um, Full-time residents who rent a room or a suite while they're still living in the house. Um, owners of a second home who use the short-term rental to offset their costs while they're not in residence. And then investors. We've seen some interest of uh, investors um, coming in and, and purchasing specifically as an income uh, and revenue generation opportunity. Um, we've also seen, in addition to people using short-term rentals for travel or uh, more tourist uh, or vacation purposes, they're also becoming an option for people who are in between more permanent housing. So for folks who may be waiting for a new house to be built or, or renovated, for those staying temporarily in the community, whether that is a short-term work assignment, um, we've seen through COVID and with some changes in remote work assignments, we've seen a lot of traveling nurses, we've seen um, a lot of other professions that are doing that. Um, and oftentimes those rentals are lasting for several months, but not necessarily for um, a year's time. But whether, regardless of how they're used, vacation property or a um, more um, longer short-term rental, for lack of a better word, um, I think we're seeing conversations not only in the Kansas City metropolitan area, but across the, the nation really about what communities can, should think about uh, and, and do as it relates to potential um, regulation of short-term rentals. So as I mentioned, kind of just this evening, we want to talk about um, our code as it applies to short-term rentals um, included in the paper. And I won't spend a lot of time on that this evening is research um, that we included from other some of our other neighboring jurisdictions, and we can certainly answer questions um, about those. And then again, council goals and objectives to help us frame kind of the next steps. Um, as I mentioned, uh, sort of data that we have on short-term rentals is pretty limited at this point. Um, when the rental licenses were distributed this year, um, our staff included um, a piece in the form or information gathering section of the form to look at a, the minimum length of time that the property could be rented, rented for. So we're hoping through that normal licensing process that at least for those that we are already aware of that we may be able to collect some additional information with respect to licensing. We do actually um, have some properties that are paying and, and remitting transient guest tax. So we know there are some. Um, I think uh, Brian had shared about $25,000 in the last five years. So it's not total, twenty five about $25,000 total over the last five years, but they're not identified by address when we get the um, remittance of the transient guest tax from the state. Um, part of the challenge in looking, and I, I think the, the uh, report included that staff had shared or had gone out, you know, and tried to um, just research on the various booking sites, uh, what might pop up. Oftentimes you can't see the actual physical address until you um, specifically book that property. Uh, I know um, something else that, that we've seen particularly here in Northeast Johnson County is sometimes our own residents don't know exactly which city they're living in. And so they may advertise their property at, uh, in another 
in another community. So that presents a challenge. Um, we have talked preliminarily with the police department, um, just trying to gather data about nuisance properties in particular. Um, because we don't identify that and it's not identified in their CAD system, um, we can't specifically identify any nuisance rental properties. Um, and so again, an area where we've talked about as we build a better database and we can connect that with the, the police department's CAD system so that we can start to uh, track this information. Um, next, the paper just really talked briefly on the fact that our code doesn't specifically at this time address short-term rentals. And um, we have pretty broad provisions uh, in the code for our, our rental units in general. Um, uh, you know, again, through our regular licensing, if the owner of a rental property doesn't reside in the county, they have to designate a Johnson County agent so that we have a local contact that we are able <coughs> to get in touch with if we do have issues with the property. Um, and under our current code, we do regulate the maintenance and safety of rental properties. So one of the challenges would be, can we make sure that we've got um, a short-term rental licensed uh, and are we aware of um, where they exist? Um, the code does regulate hotels and motels differently. Um, and so really our attention at this point has been focused on just the single family uh, properties and single family zoning districts. Um, some of our neighboring jurisdictions, Shawnee, Fairway, Roland Park, Lenexa, Prairie Village, um, Miriam, Kansas City, Missouri, um, have started to look at um, some different kinds of regulations. And again, those vary uh, kind of based on whatever the community goals and objectives are. So broad spectrum, um, we included some data, just kind of rental laws across the country. These are primarily larger cities. Um, and I think the conversation that you're hearing, particularly in Kansas City, Missouri right now, the auditors um, recently put out a report on short-term rentals focused primarily on the potential lost revenue uh, from the licensing process uh, for that. So you can kind of see nationally, again, it's there's a lot of focus on that registration and licensing process. Um, some restrict the number of days a property can be rented. Um, and, and really, as we mentioned, there's just no one size fits all solution for short term rentals. And so with that, I'd be happy. Um, I know Brian certainly will be able to answer questions, but wanted to just open it up for council committee discussion about your you know, thoughts, comments, um, and just have more of a free form discussion. Okay, so uh, council member Boltinghouse. Thank you. I just had a question in the packet. Um, there were two sections mentioned, 635.020 and then 635.030. And I just wanted to confirm my understanding. It sounded like there was a loophole in between those two sections where if you were a property owner or if you were if you resided in your own property and wanted to put that property up for Airbnb or short-term rentals, then the subsequent se section that regulates a rental property does not actually apply to you. Um, there was the, P, the, I think the staff comment was, it is important distinction that this section of the code does not apply to dwellings that are occupied by the property owner, as is sometimes the case with short-term rentals. So I guess my first question was just, is that a correct understanding that that is kind of a, a loophole in between those two? Yeah, yeah, I heard that earlier. <laughs> That's I don't know that well, but it does kind of true out, doesn't it? Just for benefit of anyone tuning in, we're having some AV issues uh, tonight with our move back to City Hall. If you, if the room sounds like it's possessed by gremlins or people are scared of the microphone, <laughs> yeah, I, and I'm just reading from the packet the the report that you and Carrie put together on that part above the municipal code. So. <laughs> I mean, I guess if if that is if if it's called out like that, that there's a yeah. So I think yeah. What can you explain that a little better? So that section six thirty five o two o falls under our business licenses, mm -hmm. and it essentially says that if one owns rental property in the city of Mission, 
whether it's a single family home or a multifamily complex or anything in between, one has to have a renter's license. So the assumption is that this is somebody that does not live on site, rather they just own the structure and they rent it out and they rent it out to leasers for a one year period. So there's nothing really that speaks to the, in the code about length of time for lease. I guess in theory, it could be two years, it could be less than a year. Um, and there's nothing that really speaks to actually being on the premises, which would be the case with somebody that's just renting out a room or a mother-in-law house in the backyard or something like that. So if I wanted to rent out my own house for short-term rental, I would not have to do the rental license piece as the resident of that house because I'm not classified as a business. Not right now. Yeah, okay. we we would not be any the wiser that you're renting out a room or okay. your garage or something like that. Okay. So um, I'll turn it back. I might have some follow-up comments on that. I just want to hear the discussion first and see how it goes. Uh, I'd head council member Davis next. I've had a situation where I am aware of someone who essentially sold their house to an investor and then remained living there for a period of time. And it was kind of set up as a reverse mortgage from what I can understand. The, the change in ownership is how I detected the, 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 the property uh, getting getting sold and it was sold to someone in new york and then trying to trace down the ownership i had great difficulty finding out it ended up that there was someone in the kansas city area kansas city missouri who was actually <laughs> managing the property on behalf of the owner so i'm looking at the difficulty <laughs> in tracking this uh, from the standpoint of how much staff time is going to go into actually enforcing something or finding methods for detection. Uh, and I was wondering whether there's any effort on the part of Mid-America Regional Council to address this more on a regional basis, or if it is being done just city by city by city. They don't have a regional, I don't believe they have a regional effort at this point. Um, you know, I think they will often, and I think they are on this issue, sort of serving as a repository for policies or ordinances or issues related to this. Um, I think, uh, you know, as we've talked about it internally and started to think about some of the things that we can do to really just build and fortify our knowledge of where these properties may exist. <clears throat> one of the things that Overland Park did, you know, they created after they had an unfortunate situation with it a uh, short-term rental property. Recently, they created a nuisance ordinance uh, or nuisance party ordinance, I think. But one of the other things that they did is they created an opportunity on their website for residents to go in and be able to report to the city um, properties that they believed to be short-term rentals or properties that they had concerns about from a nuisance uh, standpoint, specifically related the short-term rentals, again, helping to them to sort of build that out. And that's something we've talked about, whether it's through report a concern or we haven't kind of landed on a solution, but I think that would be another important sort of step in trying to collect the data uh, and be able to evaluate that. One of the things that we've talked about as well um, is that I believe, so Council Member Bolton House, I think in, in your... Um, your HOA, I think, prohibits rentals, right? You who are grandfathered in still from getting past that, but yeah, it prohibits. So the, one of the other things we've been talking about as staff is is sort of developing our and our understanding and reaching out and, and getting a clear sense of what restrictions might be in place in various HOAs um, that would limit that as well. Uh, I think the, the situation that you describe is, is an interesting one. I think there's also a lot of, there's just so many nuances to all of this. So um, I have a neighbor right now who sold their house and they're leasing it back or renting it back from the people who will be moving in in you know, six months down the road. I don't think that's probably a situation. Um, you know, when, when the 
current resident is staying longer for whatever reason, that's probably not, you know, an issue because typically what you, what you're going to hear is just, you know, it's creating a nuisance situation, whether that's noise or traffic or something like that and, and changing potentially the, the character of the neighborhood. Um, but I think it's important to think about one of the things that, you know, we've, I, I don't think we have a lot of, I mean, we're not a hot des vacation destination here in Mission, Kansas. Um, but as we look ahead and think about things like the World Cup, I think you have opportunities where there may, may be more and more people looking at least in that shorter window of time um, to, to generate revenue. Or you, um, you know, you have an opportunity for uh, there, there are issues around affordable, you know, affordable housing and the impact on housing affordability, particularly if you have investors coming in, potentially and buying up homes. Um, but I think you also have the, <clears throat> excuse me, the issue of um, sometimes being able to rent a room in, in your home or have that situation, whether it's a longer term or a shorter term rental, um, provides an income generation opportunity that allows someone to purchase a home or, or stay in a home. So. Uh, a lot of really unique issues. And again, I think um, just starting to really wade into how do we collect the information that we need and want about short-term rentals. Yeah, Council Member Kring, then Ryherd, then the mayor. Let me see if you want him. I just wondered at what point and what point of the, the journey do we define how many people could be at a particular home if they were running it for a week? What if they had a hundred people and it was a three bedroom house, but they were going to use part of the outside and, you know, people were going to come and go. At what point do we start defining, you don't want to infringe on people's independence or their rights to do something with their house, but it also, there's a traffic generation issue. There's a noise issue. There's, there could be all kinds of issues. I just wondered at what point do we look at how many people could be in a given property for a period of time? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's a good question about how you might factor that in. I think a lot of communities are dealing with it on a, rather than a number of occupants, but a nuisance standpoint. And I know that oftentimes, um, you know, the property owners who are leasing through the short-term rentals many of them, at least in my own personal experience, have been very diligent about no, no parties of any, you know, of any kind there. Um, so it's how, are, how do you make policies for the rule breakers, um, which is what we, you know, mm -hmm. what, what we're doing all the time. That the, that the ordinance stated right now, rental property, that you can't have more than three unrelated people. It does. So that would be a limitation that's in place. I mean, that's right. Cap of there's a cap similar to Shawnee. Um, and ours had been, I mean, I think that I think you find that pretty commonly in city codes. Um, yes, I've got a pretty good list. <laughs> yeah. Um uh council member right here. Yeah. So I don't know if it's uh something specific in the water board too. Um, but this is like one of the topics that gets brought up to me the most for my constituents who I think a few of you guys are here in attendance today. So I don't know, Council um, Member Chirji, if, if you'd entertain listening to any um, audience discussion or wait till after we kind of have our discussion if you want to hear from the audience. But this is something that's been brought to my attention quite a bit. Um, I like the idea of a nuisance ordinance because... <laughs> You know, I have people on my street that rent long term and they're just as much my neighbor as the people who own. But then I also see issues where we run into people throwing parties and then there's police activity involved, things like that. So um, I think ultimately, you know, anybody kind of listing their house on Airbnb needs to have some sort of regulation with no parties or things like that because things get out of control. And I guess, yeah, my question is this like, when do the rights of the rental owners start to infringe on the rights of the people that live next door because they're just living their lives trying to live it quietly and comfortably and if there's police activity every weekend or you know even a monthly basis that's just too much in my opinion um so i would like to see us entertain some sort of ordinance talk about this further for sure um i think it's important again especially because it's been brought to my attention quite a bit so 
Yeah, that's kind of where I stand on it. Just a quick question. Have yeah. each of you in your own individual <laughs> wards heard from constituents on this issue? I have. Okay. No. no. Okay. Okay, let's get through a few more hands up here and we can ask if there is public comment. Um, I had the mayor next. Oh, yeah, and Laura kind of touched on it. Um, I liked Overland's Overland Park's data collection point. I think, you know, right now we have anecdotal cases where people maybe aren't clear if it's a short-term rental or a long-term rental or an owner having a party where you do hear of, you know, a nuisance issue like Mary referenced, but I just think... Um, that the information out there, the, the main conclusion that I drew from the white paper was that we just don't really have the data at this time to be making informed policy decisions. So I appreciate that we added this to our rental form. Um, and I also would like us to do something like Overland Park that made it um, you know clear and transparent, maybe have a dedicated website or spot where people could report either issues or just identification of properties so that we could kind of collect that and and follow up and see what makes sense. You know, maybe it is we only have 10 rentals and are we, you know, creating a problem where there is none or a problem that could just be created or solved by beefing up our nuisance or noise ordinances or things like that. Or do we need more of a, you know, registration, transient guest tax, rental um, situation? Uh, Council Member Thomas, please. Yeah, um, 10 to 15 feels really low to me, just knowing the handful in Ward 1 that I know exists. Maybe I just need to pass along information. Um, but, you know, I do think there's value in short-term rentals. All the ones that I'm aware of are really well-maintained properties and oftentimes really beautiful homes that people can... <laughs> That's a new one. Um, um, but but with that said, I, I think for the safety of the people staying in them, I, uh, some sort of permitting or registration process is necessary. I um, I know that there's a lot of work to do to get there to figure out where these are and how to communicate with those those owners, be it whether they live in town or elsewhere. Um, I, I would really like to see us have something similar to Fairway and Roland Park. I also am intrigued by the notification of property owners within 100 feet. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to infringe on anyone's right to do what they want to do with their own property but at the same time maybe there's like a some sort of middle ground in that anyway that's for staff to figure out but just saying i'm intrigued by that um thank you okay um were there any members of the public that wanted to comment before we do yeah oh please yeah sorry i wanted to make sure everybody had a chance up here to speak first first of all i'd just yeah. like to go ahead and say that for most homeowners that's the most single important investment that they've made for their retirement for their wealth and it, and all the good things that go with home ownership. If you're buying in a single family area, you know, that's coded that way, then I would not want to live next to a hotel, which is basically what I consider short-term rentals to be. And um, it's kind of like what came first. If I moved into that house and it's, it's single family uh, or, you know, is regulated by that single family ordinance, then I just think it's extremely wrong to go ahead and think it's okay to have a sink, a basically a hotel operating next to you. That's all I've got to say about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there any member of the public that wanted to comment on this issue tonight? Yeah, please come forward um, right here uh, first and state your name and city of residence for the record, please. I'm Marion Murray, and I live 6118 West 57th, the corner of Beverly Lane and 57th. Um, on Beverly Lane, one house up from the corner, there's a party house. I mean, that's how we refer to it. I haven't been aware of very many quiet parties, but we've called the police a number of times one of the party goers entered the home next door thinking she wasn't there. She just happened to have her door open because she was about to leave. You know, we're having things happen that are totally disturbance uh, related that we haven't had before this. It's been a really wonderful neighborhood. I've lived in this house for six and a half years. And 
I was thinking today about the, um, I worked on the plaza for 20 years and anytime a restaurant opened that needed a liquor license, everyone within 500 yards, I think it was, was asked to sign this permit application for uh, a liquor license. And it's, we're kind of like permitting drinking parties with no knowledge of, I mean, I, I didn't realize there was, there's no application process to even have a home that's a short-term rental. Um, just learning that tonight. So, you know, if there was a, a license that they have to apply for and the application could include a fee to cover those expenses and the, um, and then once it's, the owner's motive is known, the address is known, um, the, the, the party that owns the house lives in Guam and has no intention of coming back. Um, we got to know them personally, they're wonderful people in the, um, in the armed forces and came over for a year to study it. Leavenworth and then use, decided their house would be great income maker, got a manager. So, um, but if there was an application process and also like you, you suggested, if we had, um, if we the residents had a means of uh, notifying or complaining, there's a very active party house at this address. I mean, that's a very simple way to start because we would all be more than happy <laughs> to uh, to let the city know where these houses are located. So I think you, and I agree, it is, there has to be more than 10 to 15. I probably know five people that think it's a great thing and they have a Verbo and, or a Airbnb. And I have a list of suggestions. If anybody would like me to email it, like, would you, could I, okay. All right, and appreciate having this opportunity. Chair, I just had a quick question for yep. her, if you don't mind while she's up there. Sorry, it's me. Uh -huh. Sorry, thanks. Um, I, I was just wondering, is it a short-term rental property or is it a long-term rent? It's, and it just it t tends to be a trend of a, of a party house because of the type of rental property it is? Well, he told us when we gave him his going away party that it would be, um, he wanted to call like the Visiting Nurses Association or somebody and he was assuring us it was going to be long term or you know like 30 days 60 days whatever like a contract worker would want and then we found out he had turned it into a a verbo which is short term and several weekends we've called the police sometimes twice the same night it'll get so loud there, I was just sitting here counting. There are probably at least 10 or 15 homes because of its location, you know, behind it, in front of it, across the street. So we have this email list going where we're sharing um, what's going on. It's pretty active um, with a hope that it can be shut down, frankly. <laughs> it's, it's, I think the bottom line, the question is, is it worth the revenue to the city, you know, the tourism and dining industry to have the homeowners sacrifice their peace or sense of safety and security and maybe property value for this extra revenue, which it turns out you're not even sure where they are and how much you're making off of it. I would say, make the money off the application fees, the uh, the license, to, annual license, uh, maybe even a fee to use, tap into the uh, emergency services. And if they're used more often than allowed, uh, charge another fee for each one, you know, like $500 each call to the police, something that's so high that, the regulations will be either respected or they'll decide it's not worth it. 
financially. That's my hope. Uh, can I also ask a, a question? Um, do you have any information on the manager that's managing that property? No, I think one of the neighbors tried contacting the owner and um, that was unsuccessful. And then he shut off his uh, communications. Okay. Um, we were thinking the other day, he may have been, he may be on a Facebook group that where he could reach him that way. But the fact that he quit, he had given us his cell when he moved away and then he, he blocked. But the, the individuals that reside there, do they have a point of contact for the manager? The individuals who reside? The, the individuals that you're encountering there, have you spoken to them about who is the manager that they deal with? Um, you mean like the short-term rental people? Yeah, who who it is that's actually managing the right the property? Uh, not that I know of. Um, I can ask. And we can let you know because it would be helpful if we know who the manager is yeah. of the property on behalf of the owner that mm -hmm. should be dealt with. Um, but I appreciate your story and I appreciate the information you're you're bringing forward. It looks like it's a. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they're local because I. We've all observed someone who is apparently cleaning it up. That the exterior is remains perfectly fine so far through the winter. Um, so we don't really have any complaints about how the house looks. It's just the behavior of the people. Yeah, the the reason I'm asking is that we do have nuisance ordinances that apply to anyone. Uh -huh. uh, in the city, and that's what is enforced with any kind of situation, whether it's a temporary rental or not. Uh, so we do have ways of enforcing nuisance problems, but this is a chronic situation. And I guess the question I would have is someone who's responsible for the property, if we can identify who that is, then, then we can deal more directly with that situation. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'll see if we can find that out. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had another public comment, uh, Green Coat. Just, just before we leave that particular topic, if it's the house I'm aware of, I'm sure it is, they do have a renter's license with the city. And so we do have all that information. One of the things that we discovered in working on our staff report is that there's a disconnect between the information that we have in the community development department on who has a renter's license and the information the police have, which is next to none. So when the police officers get a call for a nuisance, they show up, they don't really associate that being a renter's house or owner occupied house. They don't really associate the folks that are in the house as being the residents or renters. They just kind of deal with the situation. But um, we're gonna start sharing information across the department so that they have a data list, then they can correlate. Okay, this is a, a problem situation that we need to address and the contact the manager. And that's the reason why we have, as part of our ordinance, a name of a manager in Johnson County, just so we can contact them for any issues like that. I'll come back to council in just a minute. Do we have another public comment back by the door? And if you'd state your name and city of residence. I'm Rachel Pinchario, and I am at 5637 Beverly Lane, which is right next to this one that we're talking about. Okay. Um, the very first weekend that, is, that it opened up, it was a domestic violence situation, came up, waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning by the cops coming in, people yelling, arguing. Um, you know, the woman comes out the door with the bags, freaking, you know, getting scared to leave and then you know random people just coming out very first weekend that ex that started the next weekend another set you know party tent happening happening people are filling up the streets fill it parking it in the yard it's be next to it I don't feel safe and I would love I want something to happen so I can't feel so safe I've been there for 20 years and this just coming in it used to be a, a wonderful family neighborhood basically, you know, with the kids and stuff like that. 
or nothing's really happened. But since this come in, it's been a big issue. And, you know, I feel like, what do I have to do to get some kind of protection with this? Like for living here and this comes in, if that does that take ownership of the neighborhood? And like what you said totally relates with um, Kristen. <laughs> I was like, that's exactly, I mean, because it just, you know, Mike walk out my door, I'm like, who's next door? Who's next door? Because it's always a brand new person, always, you know, every day, a couple of days, who knows? Um, I have young, you know, dogs, I have children. It's not safe. And um, I had talked with the owner one time about it and I told him that that's not, it's one thing to have people come and stay. And I, I understand on one hand of um, short-term rentals, but this situation, is brought in trouble since it's open. And I would love for something to be done. So it's like, do I have to get up a move that I've been living here for 20 years? It's, I mean, how many police reports do I have to do? Do how many, what do I, who do I talk to? What do I have to do? It's something needs to be done. Like, hmm. sorry, <laughs> I'm emotional about it and I don't like yeah, it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And it's, so. My piece. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing. Appreciate it. And then any other public comment? And also, yeah. So one of the times, um, because like the construction people come in, because it was started to have nursing students come in and stuff like that. That's one thing. But then, yeah, these construction people coming in, random people coming in. Yeah, one person came in and walked inside my house. You know, I was about to leave and I was like, who's this? You know, and then he comes in and um like, oh, I didn't expect you to be here because I was about to leave. So I had the door open. So I was kind of like, you know, on the other side kind of thing. And it's like, um, he just walked, walked in my house and I was like, who are you? And he was just like, I wasn't expecting you to be here. Like normal people would say, I'm sorry. You know, he just acted like it, it was just very weird and like looking all over. Like, how do we get this taken care of? If I think it needs to be taken care of. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Yeah, Terry. Now this just needs to come low. <laughs> <laughs> um, Terry Ball from Ward 1. I'm at 6334 West 50th. Um, by the grace of God, we haven't had those kind of problems, but we had, there's 10 duplexes on my street, one cul-de-sac. Um, and several years ago, um, someone bought a half a duplex and turn it into what I call the boarding house. And um, I can be pretty relentless in protecting my neighborhood. So uh, I reported that to the city that um, this person was renting to four different people, actually five, one was a married couple in this one one duplex. Well, obviously there's not a lot of par parking on our street. I guess my point is because these people are obviously going through a lot worse things than we are, but I keep on top of it at all times. Um, had to go to everybody in this, in the block and get signatures to say, Hey, we do not want this boarding house in our neighborhood. Um, not really any problems, but short, definitely some short-term rentals. But what I, my question is, um, I'm assuming there's an annual renewal for the rental agreement or rental registration for this with the city. Um, is there any kind of review that takes place in terms of renewing that annual agreement? Can anybody answer that for me? Yes, Brian. Uh, there's no review per se. Um, you know, again, if there's code issues or any issues that come up, we address that with, you know, the property manager or the property owner. But there's nothing in the code that stipulates so many violations. We're not going to renew your license. Yeah, nothing like that. So. I do believe with respect to code enforcement violations, there are, or that triggers an inspection. It triggers an inspection, right? So if you uh, multifamily housing requires an inspection once a year, five percent of the units. If single family tenants, there's no inspection required. If a tenant, either single family or multifamily, 
and why to have inspection. They can ask the city and the city will come in and do an inspection. And if there's any code violations, anything like that, then we'll address it with the owner. It's a little complicated, but yeah, we do have some mechanisms in place to address primarily code issues and things like that. Not so much the nuisance aspect. So I could request that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if there's a code violation on the property. You can let us know when we get to it. But that's for the single family. It's it's more focused on whether the tenant is, feels that their property is being maintained for them, right. not the other way around. Not when it's a property owner that's saying we're having, or if the neighbors believing that there's a problem with whoever is the tenant there. There's not an inspection process for that. Correct. It's usually ten, we call it tenant initiated inspection. Oh, it's coming from the tenant, not from me. Right. So, oh, okay. Yeah. And that's, you know, there's mold, the windows are loose, you oh. know, the ceiling's broken, things like that. We'll but come in and do inspection. She could go ahead and say that there's more than three unrelated people living in the unit. Yeah, if she suspects that's the case, she could let us know and we'll investigate oh, it. No, that's when Nilo was, you know, our code person and we got, um, I got the petition signed by everybody in the neighborhood and, and we got the owner to reduce it to. Now there's exterior issues like you know, broken out windows or paint or something like that or soft that that's hanging down and we just happen to miss it then yeah be sure to let us know we can go by and inspect the property and again through that process and press with the owner okay i was just curious about the annual renewal but thank you thank you is there any other member of the public that hasn't spoken yet okay let's go back to council um I don't know who was first. We'll get you started at the end. Council Member Thomas. Sorry, you just sat back down, Brian. I just wanted to, if you can share with us that this particular house, is this, you said that they have a rental license or a rental permit. So it's not a short-term rental because we do not have a short-term rental license or permit. So it's just a regular rental license. They have a license to rent property that they own in the city. Okay. And so I, what I'm hearing is we have two issues. One being that we don't have any, you know, nuisance violations mm -hmm. remedy for long-term rentals. And so we need to figure that out. And then there's the short-term rental piece as well. And that's just my own little consensus or what I just synthesized from hearing. Well, the, the current code doesn't specify a time period for rentals, so it would Correct. theoretically apply to any length of rental, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So it could be, and we've always assumed, I think this one kind of assumes it's a one-year lease, but the more we've learned, sometimes you could have a two-year lease or you could have a lease that's less. And as Laura stated earlier, one of the things that we've put into the application for 2023 is specify the type of leases that you offer to your renters. Is it one year, greater than one year, less than one year? So again, we can start tracking some of that information a little bit better. Councilmember Bolton has. Yeah, I'm glad Laura brought up the rooftop because I was thinking about that too. Um, I, I think it really is worth calling out short-term rentals in particular in the code, you know, and creating some more information around them, you know, leaving it up. To, let's, let's have a discussion about what we want with that. But I really don't like the idea of me as a property owner, not having to follow the same standards, renting out my own home, the way that a traditional rental would be. I, I think that's a loophole that needs to be closed as well. And I also echoed the mayor, the mayor's comments earlier about Let's also look at our nuisance ordinances and see if any of that needs to be beefed up and, you know, potentially tying it to a renewal as well, if that makes sense. You know, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure how much of this Pete would echo and, and voice as well. But I, I just, it does seem like there are a few things at play here. And those are just some of the things that come to my mind from the discussion. And thanks to our guests for speaking on. And, and I would just comment that I think historically when any of our rental licensing or rental regulation policies were put into place, we weren't even, they were focused on the inspection process. We really didn't have any conversations at the time. Um, and there were a lot, there was a lot of resistance to um, the licensing process as it being a way for the city to, you know, to sort of get in and um, violate those, you know, individual property owners rights. And so 
it's probably long overdue. I mean, I think there are a variety of sections that we need to look at to say, I mean, the, the um, licensing so that we have an opportunity to make sure we have safe housing for people is one issue. And now I think we've seen that the short-term rentals pose a different set of issues and where there may be cross sections in the code or where there may be things that, um, that look differently. I think, you know, and I think, um, some of you have had more experience than others, but the police department would be the first to tell you that it's not just, there can be nuisance properties that are absolutely not rentals. Um, and so also looking at um, <clears throat> our nuisance ordinance more holistically, as opposed to just with that focus on short-term rentals so that we have that opportunity, because I think we have opportunities to strengthen that for people who own their home and have created a nuisance in the neighborhood as a result of the activity on the property. I think you summed it up very well, because to me, it's a behavior issue versus a licensing issue versus an inspection for the purposes of protecting the tenant. And likewise, the way in which we could protect the, protect the neighbors from any misuse of a property and finding out how that can be handled through whoever owns that property. So that becomes really a code enforcement issue with regards to management of, of that property. And so I think a lot of what has been said tonight sums up very well. And I appreciate the feedback that we've gotten directly from the residents in that particular situation. And hopefully we can get at least some direct response to your specific condition there from either the police department or staff, however it's going to be addressed. Any other comment? Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of points that I didn't think were covered. I, I absolutely agree that I think all the rentals need to be both safe for the tenants and safe and respectful of the neighbors. Um, I also just had a couple of concerns. I've shared these with you in the past, Laura, about you know um, when we see clusters of short-term rentals and you're creating you know spaces of you know stretches of a neighborhood that aren't well cared for. There's not a lot of you know community stake in in the in the area, or um, kind of adds to the danger of the area. And then just the amount of you know available housing stock that's being consumed by short-term rentals that um, is probably not helping any uh, with our housing cost crisis. If there's nothing else, I think I'll wrap up this item. Okay. Let me let me just summarize. Yeah, please. I think the next steps would be so. I think I heard some consensus for building out. You know what? Some of the things we're talking about internally, getting some um, something up on the website so that we have that opportunity for people to start reporting. It sounds like all of you should be the first to go in and um, you know enter some addresses that you know, would help us. Um, we've got the uh, licensing applications, but let us kind of, um, and the chief is is out of town this week. Um, so Kirk didn't have the benefit of sitting in on that, that conversation more fully, but when the chief is back, um, let us kind of put together a tentative kind of work plan or, you know, next steps forward and we'll come back and present that to you. So Laura, do you want us to go ahead and report those addresses on I have a concern on the website? Or if you want to just email them to me right now, that would be great. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's another good point to just remind the public is you, you can go on missionks.org for any concern, even if you're not sure it's city related. We'll figure it out and try to get a response to you. Um, staff are great, but there is a report a concern link on the city website, as well as just the main phone number if you have questions or concerns. Okay, with that, that's the end of our discussion items. So all that we have left are, um, Laura, are there any department updates? Uh, I'm trying to figure out what the commander still wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We applied for a Kansas Forest Service uh, grant for all over the course of five years, $100,000 in total, $20,000 each year. So we're waiting. Uh, feedback on whether or not that award will be extended to us. We're pretty excited. Awesome. Thanks, Penn. And we had a meeting with Stan. Oh, no, for Waterworks. And we're kicking off the Waterworks Park final design with a meeting with Stantec tomorrow. Uh, stakeholders, Water One, Rushton Elementary, Laura, myself, and their staff. 
Awesome. Can I have a few? Probably could go on either agenda, but I'm going to do them now because by the time we get to the end of the next agenda. Um, so just, I don't, I don't have a very specific gateway update other than to say that following our meeting in January, uh, Robin in particular has been working with um, Gilmore and Bell and the attorneys to get all the ordinances published and documents off. And so I think we've got checked all those boxes. That's ready to go. Uh, Bruce Kimmel um, is staying in weekly contact with the developer developers team. It's kind of talking about progress. He has been in contact with the underwriters throughout this whole process, but sort of re-engaged a little bit more specifically with DA Davidson, who would potentially be the underwriter or would be the underwriters for any special obligation bond issue just to <clears throat> really sort of refocus attention on bond market and timing uh, and appropriateness. Uh, I also had the opportunity to speak with the developer's attorney um, and I know they were collecting information on the approved preliminary and final development plans, which is something that needed to go to their lenders. So try to report progress as, as we have it, but there are certainly things that have been continuing to move forward uh, after our meeting. Um, many of you were able to attend the business uh, forum that we had, I think back in November, <laughs> just like a hundred years ago. Uh, one of the things that we uh, committed to doing was getting a business survey out. That survey went out two weeks ago uh, and is due back on the 15th of, okay, 15th of uh, February. And so when we get those responses back, we hadn't ha had an overwhelming response yet uh, as of last week. So, um, but I think you had 300 and what was it? How many went out? How many email addresses? I thought you told me that. Around 300, I think. So hopefully we'll get some good response from that and uh, be able to bring that forward. Um, just, we will be doing the 2022 year-end report. Our you know, fourth quarter look year-end will be included with the packet that goes out for the February 15th meeting. Um, and then the mayor and I have been looking at calendaring for the whole year. Uh, thank you for um, getting back to me last week about potential conflicts or travel dates. Uh, and continue, if you will continue to share those. Um, we are a challenging group to get calendared. Uh, one of the things that I will be sending out is kind of at least tentatively the uh, dates for our budget work sessions for this year. And I'll send those out um, this Friday with your other calendar so you can get those work sessions at a minimum. Um, and then one of the things that we had talked about was um, oftentimes um, when we have something, maybe a shorter item that we may want to have a study session or a work session on, um, I'll be sort of pulling on uh, interest or flexibility to maybe take it the hour ahead of our legislative meetings, um, since most people have that one really regularly on your calendars to um, kind of take care of some of those kinds of things. So watch for that um, this Friday. And I think that's all we have. Okay. Thanks very much. It is now 7.50 p.m. With no further discussion, that concludes the meeting of the Community Development Committee. Again, this video will be made public on our website at missionks.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would offer a break, but we have a lengthy agenda, most likely, for this one. So if you do need to um, take a break, feel free to do that at your own leisure. Um, it is 7.50 p.m., and I'd like to call this meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee to order. While this meeting is being held in person in consideration of the ongoing COVID-19 health concerns, we are offering the option for the public to participate through Zoom if preferred. Instructions on how to attend virtually are included in the city calendar, uh, city council calendar item listed on the front page of missionks.org. The public is also invited to participate in this meeting. If you are participating through Zoom, please either add your comment in the chat feature and it will be read out loud or note that you would like to speak and we will call on you to come speak your comment verbally. Please remember that your comments and questions are visible to everyone in the meeting. If you're a part of our in-person group tonight, please raise your hand and stay seated and we will call on you to go to the lectern to make your comment. When you make your comment, please state your name and city of residence for the record. Also, please be conscientious of others trying to speak and speak slowly and clearly. This meeting will be recorded and posted on the city's website at missionks.org. And please contact the admin offices at 913-676-8350 with any questions or concerns. Ms. Folks, please call the roll. Thomas? Here. Bolting House? Here. Loudon? Briard? Here. Green? Aye. Here. Hitman? Here. Chelsea? Here. Davis? Here. 
Thank you. We will now proceed with our agenda. Our first item of business is public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to comment now? All right, seeing none, we have no public presentations this evening, so we will move forward with our regular agenda. Uh, our first action item is acceptance of the January 11th, 2023 meeting minutes with Robin Folks. Thank you. The draft minutes of the January 11th Finance and Administration Committee meeting are included for review and acceptance in your packet tonight. Any recommendations for the minutes? All right, sounds good. Okay, um, we do, that's the last action item we have. We do have a discussion item and it is the discussion about consideration of regulations for electronic cigarette retailers from Laura Smith. Ms. Smith, will you please provide your report? Thanks, Rob. Slowly getting acclimated. Emphasis on slowly to being back. And um, it's it's always funny. It doesn't matter what year it is. You know, you go through the holidays and the whole world shuts down for about two, two and a half weeks. And then everybody sort of wakes up the second week of January and is like, oh my gosh, we have all these things that we were working on at the end of last year. Um, so this issue uh, back in October, uh, Council Member Davis had requested that we uh, put forth a discussion item for the Finance and Administration Committee to consider revising or zoning code regulations that would um, look at potentially imposing certain distance requirements for retailers selling vaping or electronic uh, cigarette products. Um, and so we shared some of our preliminary research back uh, at that point, just to make sure there was council consensus to move forward uh, pursuing the issue. Uh, and then just based on my schedule, um, it's taken us a while to kind of get back and um, we get this back in front of you for consideration and discussion. And so that's why we're here this evening. So as we've talked about previously, the city doesn't license um, tobacco retailers. All of that licensing is handled through the state. And there are currently nine licensed tobacco retail outlets in mission. Um, the map that you've uh, received is kind of a combination of a variety of different things. So when you look at, um, when you look at the solid red areas, um, and obviously those will also be hatched, uh, those are existing um, tobacco retail, li licensed tobacco retail outlets in Mission. So um, it's a little bit, we, we can refine this process a little bit more, but for example, if you look at um, kind of what would be Mission Mart Shopping Center, it's the Dollar General store within Mission Mart Shopping Center, not the entire, obviously, Mission Mart Shopping Center. So this is this has picked up an entire parcel. So you see um, just kind of working from east uh, to west, you've got, you would have the Dollar General, you would have um, the BP gas station, you would have um, Grand Liquor, you would have Casey's, uh, Casey's that went into the former Hartman hardware space. You would have Hy-Vee, both the main store and um, the uh, gas station. Uh, you would have CBD, American Shaman, uh, again, in a strip center uh, there where um, Admission Crossing. And then kind of going north from there, you would have uh, Crown Liquor and Tobacco um, at the corner of 51st and Lamar, and then the quick trip. So those are the so those are the existing locations where you see just the red cross hatching on this map are the current zoning districts, if you will, within which tobacco um, retailers could locate. So there are certain only certain areas of the community, as you'll see here. So that is. Um, 
actually it's a little larger in that your action item or your discussion item had talked about MS1, MS2, and C, uh, C1. Um, we do pick up some other because um, it, a, a use allowed in one zoning classification sort of falls up to the, you know, kind of the next one. So these cross cross hatched areas are the areas where um, currently within our city, uh, a, a retailer again could be licensed. Um, also, I think everybody's familiar, but none of our currently licensed retailers are standalone vape shops, but they sell their um, vaping products in addition to other tobacco products or uh, liquor or other things, convenience store. Um, the green areas are, as we talked about uh, and looked at options and talked about things back in October, uh, we really talked about the city of Shawnee's code uh, that was adopted as it relates to uh, e-cigarette or vaping uh, locations. And they had created a 250 foot buffer around any um, location that sold electronic cigarettes um, and they could not be located within 250 feet of schools, churches, commercial daycares. Um, we expanded that slightly because I know part of our conversation, so just for discussion purposes this evening, I know part of our conversation in the past has been to look at those areas where youth might be congregating um, and that visibility or that access, even though uh, there are still restrictions in place limiting the sale of these products to um, anyone less than the age of 21. Uh, that was kind of the, the conversation that um, the council and the committee had had previously. So what you see in kind of the teal or green areas are those school, church, or assembly areas. So we've included um, the community center. We've in included Tyler's house. Um, and we have, we have four commercial daycare locations. So you can see those, uh, again, the solid teal is the actual location. And then that shaded area is what would be about a 250 foot buffer around any of those properties. So at this point, you know, really, uh, and as we talked about, uh, I think we've had several questions about grandfathering existing. Uh, at this point, really the only thing that you would see that kind of has any sort of overlap in any one of those buffer zones is going to be Casey's, and that's the proximity to Tyler's house and uh, Christ Church Mission, who uh, has that location on uh, there on Johnson Drive. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the landscape, if you will, when we think about where do they exist, where could they exist, um, what are those uh, at least similar properties in our community that would align with what the Shawnee Code looked at, um, and how that would play out. One of the other things the Shawnee Code does, if you had an opportunity to look at it, it, it actually um, requires a certain distance between vape shops for e-cigarette e retailers. And they've got a mile, it's the, the code imposes a mile distance requirement uh, between each of those locations. Um, so as we've talked about before, anything that we would uh, propose to change in the ordinances would grandfather our existing licensed tobacco retailers. Uh, and so again, we're here tonight to just sort of with this visual um, and follow up and kind of see uh, council's appetite or thoughts about um, whether you want to move this issue forward, and if so, how, uh, if we were to make changes to the ordinances, these are zoning code regulations, so it would go through a plan, uh, public hearing process with the planning commission, um, and then be brought back to the city council for final consideration and adoption. All right, any uh, comments from council? I'll start with Debbie. Okay, if you've got a structure in place, an ordinance, zoning criteria, et cetera, you talk about commercial daycare. Does that mean someone who wanted to establish a home daycare could not be, could not establish it if they were within 250 feet? I mean, I think we looked at it. And when I went back to look at um, Shawnee's code, they only uh, considered commercial daycare. And so when we pulled these, I mean, we have a number of licensed home daycares throughout the community. 
uh, we only have four commercially licensed uh, daycares. So, I mean, that's, that certainly would be at the discretion of the council, but the example in the Shawnee ordinance would be restricted just to commercial daycare locations. So right now you've got Little Lambs, um, you've got Forever Young uh, Child Care, which is I think on 58th Harris. Um, there's two, they have two separate licenses over there, and then I'm drawing a blank on Gingerbread House. Gingerbread House on Woodson. I think Debbie's question might have been, what if you wanted to open? What if we passed this and you wanted to open a commercial daycare within 250 feet of Casey's, say? Would you not be allowed to rent that space for a daycare? You can do, you can do if you choose to locate okay. there, it, it works in reverse. So if you choose to locate your daycare closer, um, it would grand, I mean, what, what that would do. So anybody, Casey's would be grandfathered, whomever would be grandfathered. If you chose to locate your church, your daycare, any of those, um, closer or within that 250 foot buffer, you would be allowed to do that. There's no restriction for you to do that. What would happen if we had an ordinance similar to Shawnee's is then if Casey's went out of business, um, because if, if you had someone who came and brought a home daycare within that 250 foot buffer, the buffer has changed. And so somebody coming into that location wanting to sell tobacco would not be able to do so. I don't think the relevance is whether it's commercial or private. Personally, I think it's the health of kids you're looking at. If there's 10 kids in a private daycare versus 15 kids in a commercial daycare, the criteria is still the same. They want to maintain kids' health. So I would think you'd have to look at the housing situation too. There's a number of private daycares we have in the community and it's an issue for them, I think. Too. Well, and I think part of it is the, that's why we wanted to show you the areas in the community where a tobacco retailer could locate. So the majority of, I mean, you look at this map and the majority of our single family neighborhoods, any tobacco retailer is going to be prohibited from opening there. So it, there, I think you do have, as you look at particularly the MS1 and MS2 zoning, you have some of that where you're going to have that buffer issue and existing single family properties. Um, but that's kind of why we wanted to show where, because it's not as if it's just um, sort of carte blanche for a tobacco retailer to come in. I mean, there are already zoning classifications where they are prohibited from locating. And that's the, obviously the majority of the city. Thanks. Councilmember Davis. Well, thank you for putting this on the agenda and considering the discussion of it. Um, has all of you had a copy that was linked to the Kansas Health Institute study that was done last year? Um, we also have Sarah Prem, who's here tonight. She's with the American Lung Association, and she does have copies of that study if anybody would like a copy of it. And she can also speak to any questions that you might have in relationship to the current um, case studies that have, that have been done throughout the state of Kansas without, with regards to this policy. Um, as we began the discussion, this is really a prevention issue. It's a public health prevention issue. And it's obviously focused in the ages that are most susceptible, which are the um, middle school and high school uh, age kids. The national um, minimum for purchasing uh, cigarette or tobacco products is 21, but then it was left to each of the states to adopt enforcement structures and policies, which the state of Kansas has not done so far, but I know that there's discussion of having that adopted either this legislative session or the future. Um, the approach is really de-densifying the opportunities for kids or youth to get access to these tobacco products. And so the method of doing it in this manner to essentially say, okay, let's do buffer zones, uh, that, that's a method to try to eliminate the accessibility for, the, for that um, age group. One of the things that I would like to see us also consider is the possibility of capping the total number of retail stores, tobacco retail stores, 
to the existing nine and not have any more available or any more uh, units of, of sale in the city of Mission. When you look at the amount of stores supplying tobacco products in the city of Mission, there's plenty for accessibility for the public to purchase tobacco. So I don't think we need any more of, of the retail uh, centers. Um, so that would be one consideration I would like us to consider. The fact that we have no standalone vape shops, I think is a good thing. And if there's any manner legally that we can essentially say that vape shops, standalone vape shops or hookah bars or whatever it is, that those are not allowed in the city of Mission, I would really be a proponent of that if that's legally possible. So those are the two elements that I would recommend. I do think that the uh, if we move it to the 250 feet uh, in terms of buffer zones uh, and use the Shawnee uh, methodology for developing an ordinance, I think that that would be ideal. I also don't want to have a burdensome situation of enforcement on the part of staff. I don't think that it's something that we need staff. So we're using basically the licensing process to essentially enforce this and not have the burden of having us track a lot of uh, situations otherwise to to in, impose this kind of preventative measure so it at that point i don't know um, yeah i mean unfortunately as you and i talked about today yeah. um i prepared this based on our discussion from october and i am not prepared this evening to speak to our ability to either cap limit the total number of retailer licenses or specifically prohibit standalone vape shops or I mean I don't I think the likelihood of a hookah bar coming in is slim to none based on our underlying smoking ordinances which prohibit that uh, and again I think as we talked about in October oftentimes uh, in a vape shop um, they are you, they can't offer it for free, as I understand it any longer, but um, they can sell you a sample and you might sample a product while in, in the store. That is not something that is allowed. It's already prohibited by our no smoking ordinance or smoking ordinances. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's one thing that has been, as we've had inquiries for vape shops over the years, and they've asked about sampling of products and they've been told it wouldn't be allowed. They've kind of moved on and, and looked at different locations. So if there is any council appetite to doing something beyond, you know, the something similar to the city of Shawnee and just looking at the buffer locations, that's certainly something that uh, we'll need to have an extensive conversation with our land use attorney uh, about what our options there might be. Okay. Does that conclude your comments, Ken? So far. Okay. Mayor Flora. Yeah, I, th I think the buffer approach makes sense. Um, I think it helps that Shawnee all but already vetted that, um, you know, obviously do our own due diligence as well with our land use attorney, but that they already looked at that approach. Um, that seems to make sense to me. I did have one question on the places of assembly, and I know there's some variation uh, with the Shawnee code, but I would be curious what a version of this map that included parks yeah. would look like. That was sort of, and I apologize for not thinking of that before tonight's meeting, but kind of looking at the map, um, that was one thing that I thought of, um, just if, if we could have a second map drawn up, but I, I think the buffers make sense. I don't think trying to go out um, and play at the margins with something that might get us, get us crosswise, you know, with looking at, um, you know, a cap when really that's a state licensing manner or other things um, wouldn't necessarily be my approach, but I do, I do agree with this buffer approach. Councilmember Chosey. Yeah. I just wanted to offer a, a bit of a different perspective toward the same end. Um, I think the land use and, and zoning approach is a good one, but um, I think a lot of this focuses around attractiveness. I tried think the concept of like an attractive nuisance comes to mind. Um, I don't know if, what we can do about signage, you know, a, a storefront that's just covered in LED signs. I think that's pretty common for these kind of shops. Um, that kind of thing. You can see it from low earth orbit. I don't know that even if we have to, you know, or or decide to allow the use that we may not want to, you know, have them be that that kind of flashy, 
you know, everybody can see it for miles kind of thing. <laughs> and it, in my opinion, it just doesn't look good and add to the, to the character of the city when, when they do that kind of thing. So. Yeah. And I also was just going to, Oh, actually Hillary was going to go. Oh, you got the chair. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, so a mic. No. <laughs> um, just kind of on the heels of Sally mentioning parks as well. I know in my ward, there's a small karate studio that brings in a lot of children um, next to the existing smoke shop there on the corner. I don't know if there's a way to include like youth sports interests or somehow include that as well. Cause I, you know, even though it doesn't fall into a traditional and I'm sorry, I apologize for not bringing this up yesterday on our review, but I would be, I know that's a lot of, you know, certainly for my own childhood, youth sports and, you know, gathering instances as well, if we're going to do the buffer zone. I do like the buffer approach as well that others have mentioned. I don't see um, it being necessarily behooving us to to pursue a cap at this time, but I do think that we can take a good step with the cap, with the, the buffering. And Hillary, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Yeah. To Trent's point, um, just on the northern part of the city, um, there's just so many children in the multifamily housing up in the northern part of the city that, you know, most of most of these zones are pretty concentrated onto Johnson Drive, which, you know, I feel like if you're coming to not not that I want all of the the shops there, but if you're coming to Johnson Drive, you can expect to maybe find some some cigarettes in some stores. Right. But um these other pockets are a little bit more concerning to me. I look at like say the retreat where right across the street you do have a liquor and tobacco store. And you know, while it's fine to exist there now, I don't know that, you know, there isn't space in this conversation for us to consider prohibiting the next time a business comes in that we can't get something better for all the families that are living immediately around it because it's our only commercial district in, in Ward 1. Everything else is industrial. So um, yeah, and right next to, you know, how kids walk to school, et cetera, same thing by Quick Trip and then same thing as you round uh, Fox Ridge. But if we did incorporate the parks, I think that would take care of that little that little piece right there. But also then just thinking about I-35 visibility and standalone vape shops and, you know, they, they are always flashy um, with lights and such. So I I think there's more, you know, I'll, I'll be interested to hear, you know, legally kind of what without, you know, too much of, of a lift. I'm, I'm curious, but um, maybe expanding the 250 beyond 250 and looking at parks and other, other areas where children are gathering. Thanks. So we can certainly go back and add parks. Uh, I think, and we can look at sort of youth sports or youth activities. I think that one becomes a little bit more challenging. Uh, and I think you would have, because I think oftentimes, pretty confident the karate studio, I think the dance studio and Mission Mart and other places are tenants uh, in, in a space. And so um, limiting, the ability of a landlord to bring in, um, you know, something, something like that. Um, I mean, obviously that would be choices. I think one thing we didn't talk about, um, you know, I don't think a mile between vape shops or retailers makes sense in a community that's two and a half square miles, um, potentially. It probably does to council member Davis. Um, but I think, uh, but I think it, in listening to what council member Thomas just said, uh, if if we were to look at something similar like a buffer, you know, or a distance requirement between existing licensed retailers, could probably address some of those things in that northern area as as well in terms of at least adding to um, that location and or you know I think part of what Shawnee was experiencing was you had um, you know multiple vape shops going into properties um, and so I look at at our community and, and I think about and visualize certainly isn't what any of us would want for the downtown, you know, the downtown core. Um, and, but there are, you know, there are still locations outside of these other buffers. Um, you know, that, that may be someplace where you would want to think about, or I don't know if you want to think about um, extending that buffer so that you would have some of that uh, restriction or control over you know, what might be going on. So you wouldn't have three or four vape shops, for example. Then. Yeah. Or maybe if you looked at a block or some other distance yeah. that made more sense for the scale of the size of mission. I mean, I think we've had one existing business on Johnson Drive that's asked about the potential of adding, being able to add 
vaping products, um, again, related to CBD. Um, so similar to what you would probably find in the American Shaman store over on the Western side of town. Any further discussion? Yeah, Debbie. Does the comprehensive master plan at all look at individual business type situations and that would that apply on this one? I mean, the type of, not really, where the comp plan is not going to regulate to the specific business type going into a space. For Chelsea? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, I had one more thought. Um, and I mean, this really applies to, I think, any substance that we want to control. I do want to make sure, and I don't, to be clear, I don't know what the answer is here that we're not adding to any um, phenomenon in which, you know, you, you're you sort of making something so hard to get that people turn to illicit sources for it and, and exacerbate the problem in that direction. I know that's a, a balancing act, but I think it's worth thinking about. I, I definitely support the, the general idea, though. Additional comments? Yeah, Ken? I think the other issue that was brought up with regards to parks, and this would not be part of this ordinance, but certainly if we want to have an ordinance that eliminates smoking in our parks, that may be something to consider for the future as, as something that, that would be desirable in the parks that we have. Yeah, I, I would uh, just like to focus probably the intent of this discussion on what's currently on the table um, for the time being, but you're more than welcome, of course, to work with me as your chair in the future and bring things up and go through regular order to, to bring additional mm -hmm. items of this nature up again. And the no smoking in parks issue is um, is one I know the PRT has talked about on occasion. And so certainly that might be something that you would see in the future as a recommendation that could come forward uh, from them. Okay, so what I'm hearing is rework the map a little bit to... Um, show what the impact would be when we put our parks in. Do you want to look at some distance between retailers? And if so, what distance? I liked Solly's idea of using one mile as the scale of Shawnee and figuring out what that equivalent would be for us. You're gonna make me do my math. <laughs> Pretty an easy number. Like yeah, I'm not volunteering to do the math. I just wanted to make that yeah, clear. Yeah. Okay. I mean, not, we talked about some things internally and we played around with a couple of maps already. So we'll go back and look and see if we have something. I'll say the more I, the more I think about it, the, the idea of a limit to the number makes a lot of sense because I don't necessarily want to just spread them out evenly throughout the city either, you know? Well, you're not going to yeah. because you can't from, a, from a, so over right. a broader zoning perspective. I just don't know that we yeah. have the ability to cap the number. Or if we do, I don't know what you know, what that process looks like. Um, but we, I can find that out. I have certainly already posed that question to Mr. Heaven, so. Yeah, Ken? Yeah, I'd appreciate it if we pursue that at least to, to check it out. And I would recommend 500 feet. And then that, you know, that'll take care of itself over time when these, if these nine or any of these nine decide to go out of business, um, it should take care of the density situation. I'd also like to um, ask if Sarah Prim, who's come here on, on my behalf, if you want to have any kind of comment to, to make or to clarify some of your understanding of the current policies around the state. I, I would give out so I'm Sarah Prim. I'm with the American Lung Association in Kansas. Um, I did bring hard copies. I know some people might prefer to read these over PDFs, but I did want to, I just, I would agree with Ken saying 500. That's kind of an industry standard or a goal, I should say, uh, to do 500 feet between. Um, also, I think the Shawnee ordinance uh, specified, if this, at least it's, that's what it says in this report, the KHI prepared uh, freestanding buildings. So it couldn't be like in a strip mall. A, a new vape store had to be a freestanding building, um, which I think does impact uh, the ability of retailers. It's more expensive to locate in a freestanding building than it is to get a slot in a strip mall. So that's another option to consider. Also in the back of this report, we have some, some density facts. Um, if you look at in the state of Kansas, uh, the average for the state is one vape or smoke shop 
a tobacco retailer per thousand residents. In Mission, that is about a little bit higher than that, just a smidge higher than that. Johnson County is a half a retailer per 1,000 people. So density-wise, we're a little over, over dense. Um, so I, I like the idea of being able to cap, not putting anybody out of business, but saying nine is all we will have. And if somebody goes out, then you don't necessarily have to replace. And I'll just be here if you want them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments on this issue? On this issue? I mean, I, I might just add, um, Sarah, while you're here. So are you familiar with other cities who have capped other number of retailers? If Nobody in our general area has, but um, there are cities across the nation that have done that, and I can send you information about those cities. Is there anyone in Kansas who has capped? Uh, I think Independence, Missouri did. Okay, but no one in Kansas has capped? Not that I'm aware, no. They're managing that logistics. Yeah. Uh, one last thing. I did speak today with Charlie Hunt, who's Deputy Director of health and environment in, in Johnson County. And he extended his services in terms of consultation. If there's any desire on the part of the council or staff to contact his office. Yeah, um, I guess just as a general comment, you know, as your chair, I feel one of my responsibilities is to help bring your item um, to the, the meeting with the chances of most success and coordinating, you know, all the competing interests on the dais and everything else. And uh, I, I'm happy for Ms. Prem to be here. I appreciate your comments. I'm certainly supportive of reducing, um, you know, the access to tobacco in our community 100%. Uh, just as an order of process, I would appreciate uh, being looped in on plans to include people in meetings, um, you know, different speakers, different suggestions. I, you know, as I recall, you had floated bringing speakers last meeting and didn't really seem like there was an appetite or folks had already kind of received all the information they needed. So continuing to um, invite speakers, although it's helpful, I mean, it's certainly good information, you know, just as a, especially given an issue so, so passionate um, to, to certain members of the body, I just would like to remind everyone um, as your chair, you know, as your leadership chair, we have a process in place to kind of work your issue with you, bring things appropriately forward to the body. And I, I would like to just kind of remind everyone of that going forward um, for additional issues as well. So um, you're certainly within your right to, to invite whoever. Um, I'm happy to also try to coordinate any of that with you too in advance in the future. Uh, yeah. And I think- Trank, I make one comment yeah. on that point. Yeah. I think, you know, it has been a little fuzzy and we haven't had exactly a pristine council process on that. And so Laura and I have been brainstorming in our planning um, to send out a communication or to discuss that with council as well. Um, and especially because we have a lot of you know, new folks um, too, in terms of bringing, bringing items to the agenda or bringing speakers and that sort of thing. Thank you. All right, is there any additional uh, council comment on this item for this evening? Okay, so thank you. So lastly, we do have department updates uh, this evening with Laura. Is there anything for the Finance and Administration Committee you'd like to share? Yes, only because I forgot it for Community <laughs> Development Committee. Uh, and going back to the short-term rental issue, one of the things I failed to throw out for conversation as we go through this process, it was it was very nice to hear from um, the residents who were here. Yeah. If we build the website, um, would you like us to consider or bring back some options for soliciting additional public comment, whether through a survey or a public forum? Um, just, I mean, I think sometimes if we put, if we say, hey, this website's out there, we don't necessarily drive the interest in that, but that's, we've talked about, you know, that process internally, and I just forgot to put it, put it out there. So we can, we can make that part of what the work plan, and then you can kind of consider options and look at that in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's all I have. Sounds great. Uh, well, it is now 824 PM, and with no further discussion, that concludes tonight's meeting of the Finance Administration Committee. Again, this video will be made public on our website at missionks.org. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your evening.